So, uh, I, you know, what I want to talk about is this notion of recovery for the Balkans. And, um, you know, wherever you look in the region, you see economic problems. And indeed, some of those are spilling over into social uh, problems as well. We've seen street protests in, in some cases, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, most recently, and basically the region uh, has not really recovered from the impact of the global crisis uh, five years ago. Uh, it's still starting to get out of it, and I've listed some of the problems here about the limited growth, the, the, the fiscal condition is very poor in most cases, the banking sectors, although they're stable, they're plagued by high levels of non-performing loans and, and uh, this ugly word, deleveraging, which is going on and and indeed the the whole reform process and business environment is lagging behind in this region uh, uh, as exemplified in our uh, transition report title stuck in transition but our view my view as I've propounded in this room a number of times and I think the view of our bank is that uh, medium term there is a lot of potential uh, uh, in this region and indeed potential for uh, entrepreneurs. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm chiming very much with Africa's optimistic uh, vision for the uh, medium and long term future. So what I'll do is just show you a few of the macro charts and then come back to some of these themes from the transition report. So just zipping through quickly, uh, here you have our uh, <coughs> current growth forecast. So yeah, for each country uh, showing 2012, 2013 and uh, our uh, forecast for 2014. So it's really a story this year, without going country by country, it's a story of pretty modest growth, typically 1%, 2% or so this year, well below the kind of potential the region has, well below the pre-crisis levels. Perhaps a word on Croatia, since um, Africa is Croatia, we have the ambassador here also, and uh, we our current projection is 1% growth this year, but frankly, looking at the most recent data, I think even that is a bit optimistic, and I think even the government is uh, is expecting less than that. So when when you're when you're more optimistic than the government, you really have to look at your forecasts and, and think again. So we might be downgrading that forecast uh, as the IMF have just done uh, next uh, next uh, round. So uh, modest growth, high unemployment. Uh, you can see how the unemployment rates have changed since two thousand and eight. And they've reached really quite frightening levels, I would say, in, in a number of countries in the region, above 20% in, in Serbia, Bosnia, and Herzegovina, Macedonia, uh, and uh, worst of all, in, in uh, Kosovo. Now, uh, if you have a sort of Keynesian training, you might think, well, the government can step in and spend more. But when you look at these fiscal deficits and how they have changed since pre-crisis, uh, period, you see that there really is uh, there's no scope at all really for expansionary fiscal policies. These countries, particularly Serbia and Albania, but also Croatia, are running high deficits. Indeed, Croatia is now under this uh, EU's excessive deficit procedure, so they have to get the deficit down yeah, in the coming years. Uh, and public debt, uh, again, this is as a percentage of GDP, and you can see the rise in all countries, and particularly sharp rises in, in Croatia, Montenegro, uh, Serbia, and uh, uh, Albania. So, so when, when public debt in, in countries like these uh, is about 60% of GDP, that really sets off uh, alarm bells uh, among investors and, and uh, indeed anyone else who, who looks, at the, uh, looks at the country. Uh, on the uh, investment side, foreign direct investment has dropped dramatically in some cases since the pre-crisis period. What I'm showing here is quite, FDI can be quite lumpy from one year to another. So here we're taking the average of 2004 to 2008, which were the boom years, versus 2009 <coughs> to uh, 2012. So you can see the big drop here in Croatia, not uh, smaller drop in Serbia, but uh, from a lower level, and Bulgaria and Romania, sort of off the scale, uh, you know, these are really up here, uh, pre-crisis, big FDI boom, post-crisis, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's fallen through the floor. Okay, now that's the kind of gloomy side. On the more positive side, uh, I, I think any, any recovery is, is bound to be export-led in this region, and indeed you see 
if you take year on year growth in exports, you see uh, there has been quite a significant recovery post crisis. There was a dip again in 2012, but in 2013, uh, in most countries, uh, exports uh, grew again. Uh, this has helped to bring down current account deficits, which were a very significant vulnerability in the pre crisis periods. You see in Montenegro, current account deficit was about 40% of GDP back in uh, 2007. It's still quite significant in Montenegro, but much less than before, and we're even having surpluses now in a couple of uh, countries like Croatia uh, and uh, Bulgaria. Now, uh, all of which leads me to say that uh, although you can see a lot of problems in the macro picture, uh, broadly speaking, the situation is stable. We have low inflation everywhere. We have banking systems that are stable. We have countries, all countries have significant levels of foreign reserves. Uh, the fiscal situations are being addressed, I, I, I believe. And, uh, and it leads you then to look at the potential uh, for convergence. So what I'm showing here, and this is from Eurostat data, this is GDP per capita. It's an index. So the index is 100 for the EU 28. Uh, average. I've put the Eurozone average here, which is about 110, I think. Uh, and you can see that uh, in all countries except Croatia, GDP per capita, adjusted for purchasing power uh, standards, is uh, less than half the uh, EU average. So um, we know from economic theory, and we know also from economic uh, experience, uh, that poorer countries can and should grow faster than richer ones, provided, of course, the right conditions are uh, in place. Uh, now, what are going to be the growth drivers? Well, I think the <coughs> EU accession process is, uh, of course, a very important driver, and I've just summarised here in the table, I'm sure you all know, uh, where countries stand in the process, and indeed Croatia's accession last year was a, really a, a milestone uh, for the region. So, uh, although this is a, uh, a slow process, it, it is ongoing, and it is something that still has strong support uh, in the region. And of course, once countries are in, then they have access to substantial EU cohesion funds, which uh, we know are complicated to use. And, and, and indeed, if you look at utilization rates in, in Romania, and Romania especially, and also Bulgaria, uh, they are below expectations. But uh, uh, the hope is that now Croatia is in, and that it can use these funds uh, effectively. But it's not just about the external anchor of accession, but it's also about uh, cooperation within the region. And uh, uh, as Efka spoke about eloquently, and, and uh, let me show you this nice picture from a few weeks ago. We had, uh, we at the EBRD hosted a major conference on Western Balkans plus Croatia. Uh, we had four or 500 business people and investor investors attending, but uh, crucially, we also had all Prime Ministers of uh, the region. Uh, you can see the Croatian Prime Minister here, Mr. Milanovic, but all the others. Think of how remarkable this would have been some years ago, to have Serbian Prime Minister Mr. Dacic on the same stage as the Kosovo Prime Minister Mr. Uh, Taci. This, by the way, is the EOD and President <laughs> uh, Suma Chakrabarti. So, um, so I think there is really a recognition that uh, regional cooperation is not something that has to be imposed from the outside, but is really in the interests of the countries themselves. And, and Africa, your institute, I think, is uh, a living, uh, a living example, uh, a living example of that. And, and indeed, Croatia, in which you know is in some ways part of Central Europe, but it's also got these links to Southeastern Europe, is, is really a crucial country, I think, in this process for bridging this uh, these two these two uh, regions. Okay, now let me, uh, <coughs> that's the broad micro picture. Let me now come to the, um, the transition report. And, and we are, uh, I may say, we're, we're very proud of this year's report. I think we're, we're always proud of our transition board. We put a lot of effort into it and, and, and care. But this year, I think it has, uh, I know from presenting the report in a number of places, including in Zagreb in, in, in January, it really resonates with people. They, they really uh, engage with the, the messages of the report. And it's, the report is really a, a political economy one. It's about, uh, it's about the link between politics, links between politics and, and economics. It's about how 
reforms, democracy, the economic growth all go together. It's about the role of institutions in driving growth, and it's also about the importance of education and the importance of uh, inclusion and, and uh, promoting equality of uh, opportunity. These are the, these are the, uh, the main themes. Now, uh, conscious of time, I'm not going to uh, give you some of the, a summary of the whole report, but I want to take just a few charts from the report to make what I think are the most uh, important points for this region. Uh, one is about the, uh, the importance of economic institutions and what drives them. So this is a, a colorful uh, chart which shows country by country uh, some different measures of economic institutions. They're mostly World Bank measures. The, the, we've used the World Bank's global governance indicators. So these are things like rule of law, control of corruption, government effectiveness, regulatory quality. We've also used the World Bank's doing business scores. And we have our own indicators as well, the EBRD transition indicators, which are another measure of, uh, uh, of, of the quality of, uh, of institutions and, and, the, um, and also the, the challenges, challenges ahead. So the details are in the report how we calculate these and normalize them. But, but basically, the higher up you are, the better your institutions. And you can see that the Southeast European countries are mostly here in the middle. So they lag behind uh, the uh, Central European countries here typically. Here's Croatia here, and then further down Romania and Bulgaria, Montenegro, and then down all the way to uh, Albania here. Uh, but the, the question we ask in the report is what determines economic institutions? How can you explain these big, this big variation between the likes of Estonia here and Turkmenistan over here? And there are uh, there's a menu of possible Explanations, uh, and we, you know, we ran some, you know, quite sophisticated econometric tests and that. I won't go into any of the details, but just to say that among these possibilities for explaining why some countries have good institutions and some bad, the one that really dominates is uh, trade and financial sector openness. So the more open countries are to trade and, and uh, foreign investment and, and capital movements, uh, the better the quality of their institutions. Um, and this is something that is fairly robust to different, different ways of estimating and controlling for different factors and, and so on. <coughs> now, when it comes to the uh, EU accession countries, one thing we found that was very interesting, and I wanted to show it here, is that if you look at progress and reforms, which we measure by the, the annual change in the, uh, the world governance indicators that I had on the previous chart, you can see that for the accession countries, so these are the countries that are, that, that are in now, that joined the transition countries, the reforms really uh, are at their peak in the three years prior to uh, accession. Uh, so that, uh, that's, that's all very good. Of course, what then happens once countries join is that the reforms tend to, uh, tend to fall off uh, after that. Okay, now uh, we have a chapter, and I think uh, for EFCA and others this will be perhaps the most interesting one. It's on uh, uh, education and um, human capital more, more generally. And what we argue in this chapter is, uh, <clears throat> I mean, firstly, the importance of education as a, as a driver of, of growth and <coughs> a driver of reforms, but also uh, <clears throat> as a way of keeping people in the country and, try and avoiding this problem of brain drain. And what we argue is that actually, if you compare the transition countries and the advanced countries, there's not that much difference, not too dramatic a difference between the quality of education at the primary and secondary level between the two regions. But it's really at the tertiary level that the uh, differences are most marked. And here we're proxying, we have a various measures of this. And of course, the two I'm showing here are the number of science and engineering doctorates transition adjusted for population obviously for, for transition versus advanced countries and the number of patents granted this is world intellectual property organization patents which you see you can barely see on the chart here for the transition countries relative to to the advanced so the report really emphasizes the importance of uh, focusing on third level education and then uh, i come finally to this point about uh <coughs> something that is new for us in the transition port to write about, economic inclusion. And, and here I mean inclusion of opportunity. 
Now, this, I think, is the most interesting part of the, uh, my presentation and also of the report, but it takes a little bit of explaining. What we did uh, in this chart is we wanted to measure <coughs> inequality of opportunity. And the way we do this, uh, to simplify a little bit, but the way we do it is as follows. We have a, we have a big survey across country of individuals. It's called the Life and Transition Survey, and I, I, I've spoken about it in this room before. We've carried it out twice, once in 2006 and once in, in uh, 2010. And we interview about 1,000 people in, in every country. And from that survey, we can get some kind of measure of how wealthy people are. And we measure that by the amount of assets they have. So some people are very asset rich, and some people are asset uh, poor. Now, what this chart is doing is it's trying to explain how much of that variation in each country between the rich can be explained by just a few factors that are given to you at birth that you can do nothing about. So whether you were born in uh, an urban or rural area, uh, the level of your father's education, the level of your mother's education, <clears throat> and whether one of your parents was a member of the Communist Party. So these are things that you can do nothing about, but it turns out that in some countries, just by running a simple econometric regression, they have a lot of explanatory power for the differences in wealth within a country, particularly in Croatia, and particularly in pretty much all the other ex-Yugoslav countries, as well as a few countries further east like Georgia and uh, uh, Tajikistan. That, I think, is, is very interesting finding, and I think part of the explanation comes from this last <laughs> chart I will show. <clears throat> In the same survey, we asked people, what are the factors, what is, what is the most important factor for success in life? So you could, there's a little menu of options. One is hard work and effort. Another is level of education. Another is uh, criminal activities. But there's one option which is political connections. Okay. Now, what percentage of people in each country said political connections are the most important? Well, in Macedonia, almost half people said that's the most important thing. Then followed by Serbia, 43%, something like that. Then Croatia, about 42%. Bosnia, about 35%. Kosovo, similar. Montenegro. It's absolutely remarkable, I think, uh, we have Slovakia and then Slovenia, so Slovakia is sort of <laughs> destroying the perfect <coughs> uh, symmetry of this chart of having all ex Yugoslavia dominating. But uh, I think it's uh, a very striking finding that the importance of connections, uh, veze in the local language, right? <laughs> uh, in, in, uh, in people's perceptions of how to get on in, in life. And it's a, a striking illustration of the, uh, of the uh, inequality of opportunity in, in this region. And we know from various, well, many academic studies that inequality of opportunity that's high tends to hold back the country's uh, development. Okay, so just lastly, uh, a few lessons for the uh, accession <coughs> countries, and that, so those countries that are in the process of trying to get into the EU are not. And I think the, the first one is maybe the most important one about the need for reforms to take place now and not wait until three years before accession. Because we know, even under optimistic scenarios for Serbia or Montenegro, and never mind the others, uh, accession is going to be much more than three years from, uh, from now. Um, and the other points, I think, are also, I think, self-evident from the analysis and the report. The need for openness to trade and investment, the need for a better business environment, the need to address uh, uh, inadequacies in education and uh, inequality of opportunity. And, and in this region, I think, the need also for greater regional cooperation, because that's where some of the big benefits can, can come from. Okay, thank you very much.